good afternoon everyone I now open hearing number 18 of the 188th period of sessions of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights which is entitled abortion access in the United States this uh, hearing was requested by a number of organizations including abortion care network Amnesty International Center for Reproductive Rights uh, CUNY School of Law Global Justice Center, If, When, How, I like that name, <laughs> I passed, Lift Louisiana, Obstetricians for Reproductive Justice, Physicians for Human Rights, Pregnancy Justice, RH Impact, Sister Song, Women of Color, Reproductive Justice Collective, Women Enabled International. The purpose of the hearing is to present updated information on the situation of access to reproductive services, health services in the United States, um, and particularly in the framework of the ruling of the case of Dobbs. My name is Roberta Clark, and I'm the second vice president, and I'm also the country rapporteur for the United States, and I'm also a rapporteur for the rights of LGBTI persons. I'm accompanied to my right by uh, Julissa Mantia, who's the rapporteur for the rights of women, and also the rapporteur for memory, truth, and justice. Um, and also to my left, uh, the Deputy Executive Secretary, Mr. Jorge Mesa, who will be with us in this hearing. So again, greetings to the representatives of the state and civil society organizations. And I want to explain the distribution of time. First of all, civil society will have um, 25 minutes. The state has 25 minutes um, in, uh, to make its own presentation. The commission, we have cut down our time to 10 minutes so that you have uh, five more minutes each. So we will make comments or remarks or questions in 10 minutes. Then civil society, back to you for uh, any further comment you may have for 12 minutes. The state has another 12 minutes, equal time, and then we will close as the commission. So that's where we have it. And then let us start with civil society organizations. Please begin. You have the floor. And um, the time is on the screen, so you can see. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, honorable commissioners, members of the secretariat, and members of the US delegation. Thank you for granting this hearing. My name is Rachna Desai Martin. I am uh, she, her pronouns. I am the chief uh, government and external relations officer at the Center for Reproductive Rights. We are a global human rights organization that uses the power of law to advance reproductive rights as fundamental human rights. I'm here today on behalf of 14 civil society organizations who participated in this hearing request. Dobbs marked a cataclysmic regression on abortion that has resulted in a wave of abortion bans across the United States, and that every day undermine individuals' rights to life, equality, and health. The rollback on abortion rights has also positioned the US as an outlier in the global trend towards liberalizing abortion, thus further widening the gap between US law and human rights standards. By eliminating the right to abortion, the U.S. now forces people to be pregnant and give birth in a country that normalizes pre preventable pregnancy-related deaths and injuries, non-consented care, and mistreatment in the health system. Obstructs meaningful options for where, how, and with whom individuals experience birth, and provides little or no legal recourse for these violations. Over the past 30 years, international and regional human rights bodies, including this commission, have confirmed that abortion is a human right. The World Health Organization also recently adopted guidelines for ensuring access to safe and legal abortion. After the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, leaders around the world and the UN Commissioner for Human Rights denounced the decision as a violation of international human rights law. We look to this body today to make a range of critical recommendations to bring the United States more in line with human rights law and public health guidance. Today, you will hear from Astrid Ackerman, a litigator at the Center for Reproductive Rights, who will testify on the post-Dobbs US legal landscape on abortion, from Kirsten Hogan, who will share her experience of being denied abortion care after her water broke early, 
from Katie Quinones Alonso, Executive Director of the Women's Health Centers of West Virginia and Maryland, who will describe Dobbs' impact on her independent abortion clinics, and Monica Simpson, Executive Director of Sister Song, Women of Color Reproductive Justice Collective, and a leader in the reproductive justice movement. She will highlight the disparate harms that communities that have been historically pushed to the margins have experienced in the wake of Dobbs. Thank you. Esther. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Astrid Maricela Ackerman, staff attorney and litigator at the Center for Reproductive Rights. Today, I will discuss the U.S. legal landscape after Dobbs, the case in which the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Dobbs undid nearly 50 years of precedent protecting the constitutional right to abortion. This was the first time in its history that the Supreme Court took away a fundamental right. As a consequence, states can now prohibit at any point in pregnancy abortion. Dobbs' impact has been catastrophic, paving the way for a regime of forced birth and forced parenthood. Since Dobbs, 14 states have enacted total abortion bans. Although most states purport to have exceptions to save the life of the pregnant person, and in some states, in cases of rape or incest, these do not prevent human rights violations, and in effect, they act as total bans. One of the states with the most re restrictive abortion bans is Texas, where providing an abortion can be punished by up to 99 years in prison. Although the ban has an exception for medical emergencies, the fear of prosecution and civil liability has led healthcare professionals to delay or refuse abortions that are necessary to preserve a pregnant person's life or health. In March, we filed to Roski v. Texas to clarify the scope of the medical emergencies. The plaintiffs in our case include 13 women who were denied abortion care. Some women were forced to flee Texas to obtain an abortion. Others were forced to carry their pregnancies to term, while others who were suffering pregnancy complications were forced to get sicker before they received an abortion. Several women have described the harm they endured to the vans as torture. The trauma our plaintiffs are enduring is harrowing and extreme, but it is not uncommon. As our Texas case makes its way through the judicial system, the list of plaintiffs continues to grow. And we continue to hear from people suffering similar experiences in other states with abortion bans. Recently, we filed similar cases in Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Idaho on behalf of eight women who were denied abortions despite dangerous pregnancy complications. And I want to note that lawmakers are enacting these bans despite the fact that nearly two thirds of Americans think abortion should be legal in all or most cases. To protect the right to abortion, voters across the US are stepping up. Within six months, of the Supreme Court's ruling in Dobbs, voters affirmed abortion rights in all six states where abortion was on the ballot. And just yesterday, voters in Ohio enshrined abortion rights in their state constitution, guaranteeing the right to make and carry out one's own reproductive decisions, including on abortion, fertility treatment, contraception, and maternity care. These voter efforts make clear what we all know to be true, the Dobbs decision is wrong and is out of step with what the majority of Americans want. It is causing profound harm to individuals and communities, and it weakens the power of US law to uphold the nation's international, regional, and domestic human rights violations. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I welcome your questions. Good afternoon, my name is Kirsten Hogan and I live in Texas. I'm one of the plaintiffs in the Zorowski v. Uh, Texas. Over two years ago, I was living in Oklahoma when I realized I was 12 days late. I lost several pregnancies to miscarriage in my 20s and was convinced I would never, sorry, <laughs> already, um, I would never be a mother. 
So when my pregnancy was confirmed, I was certain that this would be my only chance to have a baby. I didn't fully realize at the time, but I was in a toxic and abusive relationship and feared how my partner would react. But as I entered the second trimester, I decided it was time to tell him. His first reaction was, good for you, which is not what I was hoping for. <sighs> the conversation became volatile, and he made it very clear he did not want our child in his life. He was leaving for a work trip in a few days, and he told me he would go to California, we would go to California, to get an abortion when he got back. An abortion was already illegal in Oklahoma, and I was too scared to argue. The second that he left, I packed all my belongings into a van, and I drove away. A friend of mine in Texas was pregnant too, and I thought that I would be safe there. At first, things were looking up. Uh, I found a house to rent and secured a very good job. Um, on 5 a.m. on the first day of work, I woke up in so much pain, I thought I was about to give birth. Terrified, I called 911. Uh, the dispatcher told me to unlock the door and to lie down and wait for the EMTs to arrive. It was the longest five minutes of my life. I was eventually transported to the nearest hospital based on, it was based, on, based on the prior heartbreaks of miscarriage. I was already convinced my son was gone. At the hospital, I learned that my water had broken prematurely and that all they could do was monitor my situation. They did not tell me how much my son's chances of survival, but the one thing they did make clear repeatedly was that I should not leave. The staff made me think that if I tried to discharge myself to seek care elsewhere, I could be arrested for trying to kill my baby. I really wanted this baby, so of course I stayed. Every four hours around the clock, they'd bring in the Doppler and monitor the baby's heart rate. If it was too low, they would get me up and make me walk around. When I needed to use the bathroom, a nurse would always go with me to watch and make sure that I didn't push. I was too scared to have a bowel movement because I knew the amniotic sac was already protruding. Even though I said I didn't want any religious counseling, they sent in a chancellor to guide me, and they kept saying it would be good for me. The goal, they told me, was to get my son, who I had named Eamon Blake, to 22 weeks gestation when he might be able to survive on his own. The staff never discussed abortion care with me. For four days, there were no changes, just the same feeling of birth coming too early and of everything somehow being my fault. And at every turn, staff reminded me of how unmarried and how alone I was. My son didn't make it to 22 weeks. On the fifth day in the hospital, while using the restroom, my son started to be born, and I was rushed to labor and delivery, where he was stillborn. It took two more hours of labor and delivery uh, to deliver the placenta. By that time, it was late in the afternoon, and at 7 a.m. the next morning, they came in with a wheelchair and all my belongings and sent me home with papers saying I could was cleared to return to work the next day as if nothing had happened. My therapist had has helped me realize that I am was not only a victim to circumstance, but that I was exploited and not told enough so that I could make my own informed decision. Without coercion, so much was taken away from me. Texas law caused me to be detained against my will for five days and to be treated like a criminal, all during the most traumatic and heartbreaking experience of my life. I was made to feel less than human. It is unfair that there is no mechanism to fully hold the state of Texas accountable for what happened to me. I'm here sharing my experience with you because women deserve better. This shouldn't happen to anyone, no matter who they are or where they live. Thank you. Hello, commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Katie Quinones Alonzo. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the executive director of two independent abortion clinics, Women's Health Center of West Virginia and Women's Health Center of Maryland. Today, I'll share the impact of the Dobbs decision on independent abortion providers across the country and the direct impact on the clinics I oversee in a largely rural region in the South and East US called Appalachia that is drastically underserved, underinvested in, and deprived of comprehensive healthcare options. In the US, abortion care is provided in physicians' offices, hospitals, clinics, and independent abortion clinics like ours. Although independent clinics represent about 24% of all facilities offering abortion care, we provide 55% of all abortion procedures nationwide. We meet this need even though we are under-resourced and under attack by both anti-abortion legislators and protesters outside our buildings. Since Dobbs was decided, at least 65 independent clinics have been forced to close or stop providing abortions. My clinic in West Virginia is one of them. 
Much of Appalachia is now an abortion care desert, existing within a country with deep disparities in access to health care and health outcomes. Abortion is either banned or extremely restricted in nearly all of the southeastern United States. Forcing people to travel many hours over hundreds of kilometers to access abortion care, taking on unnecessary financial, physical, and emotional burdens. I remember the day that Roe was overturned vividly. I huddled our staff in the reception area of our West Virginia clinic and I broke the news to them. Our team had made harrowing phone calls to dozens of patients that day. One patient was driving her car. She had to pull over because she could not stop sobbing. Another patient was in high school and she asked if she could call us back when she got off the bus and got home so we could talk with both her and her mother because she didn't understand what was happening. We believe people need more access to health care, not less, but in September of 2022, West Virginia lawmakers passed one of the most extreme abortion bans in the country and said they did it with the hopes of closing my clinics. For years, Women's Health Center of West Virginia had been the only abortion clinic in the state, but since the ban was enacted over a year ago, we have been unable to provide abortion care to our community in West Virginia. Nevertheless, our West Virginia clinic remains a critical resource for health care services, including annual exams, birth control, and breast and cervical cancer screenings. Instead of closing our doors, my staff and I reflected on what community needs still existed. We expanded services to include gender-affirming hormone therapy for trans and gender-diverse patients. Our state leads the nation in opioid overdoses, so we launched a harm reduction program to address it and the spread of HIV and hepatitis C among people who use drugs. And our team worked tirelessly to raise over a million dollars to open an abortion clinic on the West Virginia-Maryland border to continue offering the full spectrum of reproductive health care, including abortion care, to our community. We see patients from all walks of life, young people, people who earn low incomes, people of color, people living in rural areas, people surviving intimate partner violence situations. We've seen people with wanted pregnancies and people in loving and safe situations who simply cannot continue a pregnancy. No matter who they are and why they are seeking abortion care, we trust them and believe them and we provide them with the care that they need. The Dobbs decision has devastated my staff and the communities that we serve. West Virginians, like patients in other states where abortion is banned, are forced to delay care, travel longer distances, and pay more in medical, transportation, lodging, and child care costs to access essential abortion care that they need. In states where abortion remains legal, Chronically under-resourced clinics are working hard to meet patient needs, but with so many states without comprehensive abortion care access, the pressure is immense. In the U.S., our ability to exercise our fundamental human rights to bodily autonomy, self-determination, and reproductive health depends on where we live, our access to resources, and who we are. My colleagues and I dream of a world in which every person can make decisions about if, when, and how they become parents, and we will continue to work to make that dream a reality for all of us. Thank you again for this opportunity and I welcome your questions. Good afternoon. My name is Monica Simpson and I am the Executive Director of Sister Song, a national Southern-based activist organization dedicated to reproductive justice for women of color as well as people of color. Today I will speak about how communities that have historically been pushed to the margins have borne the brunt of the harm caused by post-Dobbs abortion bans and restrictions. U.S. history and tradition is deeply rooted in racism, patriarchy, sexism, and other forms of discrimination. Even before the Dobbs decision and the ensuing onslaught of abortion bans and restrictions, black women and other communities that already face multiple overlapping forms of oppression, including indigenous and other people of color, people with disabilities, those living in rural areas, young people, immigrants, LGBTQ people, and people with limited financial resources, faced significant disparities in access to health care and health outcomes outcomes, including sexual and reproductive health. Abortion bans and restrictions disproportionately impact these communities and now, must, and now folks must travel long distances across multiple state lines to reach a state where abortion remains legal. Not all pregnant people have the resources to arrange travel, take time off work, or to find child care for the children while they ha that they already have while they're away. Travel barriers alone can be particularly challenging for people with caregiving responsibilities, a disability or illness, immigrants, young people, and individuals experiencing abuse from partners who control their movements and finances. These barriers also raise the cost of obtaining an abortion and can push people further into pregnancy. 
Under these circumstances, some people are forced to continue their pregnancies amidst a maternal health crisis. The U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate among wealthy countries. While maternal mortality is declining in most countries, it is rising in the U.S. and, and disproportionately threatens the lives of women of color. Regardless of income or education, black women and indigenous women are two to three times more likely to die of pregnancy related causes when white women are than white women are. And recent data indicates that native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islander people have the highest rates of all. I'm getting loud, Anna. Oh, I can slow down too. I'm sorry. I can do that too. I can do that too. Thank you for that note. I appreciate that. The majority of these deaths are preventable. In the years before Dobbs, U.S. data trends showed that compared to states where abortion was accessible, states that had restricted abortion had, re had fewer maternal health care providers and higher rates of maternal and infant mortality. The Dobbs decision and the subsequent wave of state attacks on abortion have worsened what has already shown itself to be a crisis. In the United States, an individual's reproductive rights and reproductive health outcomes depend heavily on where they live, how much money they have, and whether they face discrimination while seeking to act on their health care decisions. This has always been true and has become even more apparent since Dobbs, in which the court claimed that abortion access and regulations should be decided by state-level political processes. But fundamental rights should not be up for debate. Black women created the reproductive justice framework nearly 30 years ago. They asserted that everyone has the human right to bodily autonomy, to have a child, to prevent or end pregnancies without shame, and to parent our children in safe and healthy environments. Our state and federal institutions, laws, and policies must support all of us in meaningfully exercising our rights to make decisions about our bodies, our families, and our futures. Thank you. I apologize for the fastness. Um, but I do welcome your questions. Uh, if, it, if it's OK. Uh, OK, perfect. Uh, well, we wanted to just uh, sum by thanking the commission for noting its concerns uh, about the risks to women's health and lives caused by the wave of state abortion bans in the U.S. on Dobbs' anniversary, for highlighting the situation in its 2022 annual report, and for granting today's thematic hearing. To ensure that the harm stemming directly from the U.S.'s retrogression on abortion continue to be documented, we respectfully ask the Commission to again note the worsening situation in your 2023 annual report. We further respectfully ask the Commission to make the following four recommendations to the United States. We note that these reflect the concluding observations to the U.S. following its recent review by the U.N. Human Rights Committee. First, immediately halt the retrogression in abortion rights and access by providing legal, effective, safe, and confidential access to abortion, including medication abortion, without discrimination and free from violence and coercion, and bringing U.S. law, policy, and practice in line with the 2022 WHO abortion care guideline. Second, put an end to the criminalization of abortion by removing abortion from its criminal code and prohibiting the prosecution, punishment, or surveillance, especially in healthcare settings, of individuals, providers, and those who provide non-clinical support for conduct during pregnancy and pregnancy outcomes, including abortion, miscarriage, and birth. Third, redouble its efforts to prevent and combat maternal mortality and morbidity, and to eliminate discrimination and disparities in sexual and reproductive health and rights, in particular, racial and ethnic disparities, and integrate an intersectional and culturally respectful approach in policies and programs aimed at reducing high rates of maternal mortality and morbidity. And fourth, strengthen legal protections for the right to life and non-discrimination, including intersectional discrimination, and ensure that individuals who have suffered health harms and violations of human rights, including cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment in states like Texas, are afforded remedies and resources that address the harm caused by preventable maternal mortality and morbidity, abortion restrictions, and other violations of their reproductive autonomy. Thank you again for granting this hearing and for affording us the opportunity to speak with you. We look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And we will get the 
the recommendations. Um, yes, we will also send them to you in writing. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. And now I turn over to representative of the state. You two have 25 minutes and over to you. Thank you, Commissioner Clark. My name is Thomas Hastings. I have the honor of joining you here today in my role as the Deputy Permanent Representative of the U.S. Mission to the Organization of American States. I'd like to thank first our distinguished commissioners and Secretary of staff. Uh, I'd like to thank representatives of all the organizations who've come to be here today and also especially Ms. Salas for bringing your personal experience as well. Thank you for being here. Um, hearings such as this one provide a space for us to learn more about the work of the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights and the work that they do to promote and monitor the situation of human rights. It also gives us the chance to hear directly from those who have raised concerns with the Commission about issues here in the United States. So thank you for being here. At the U.S. Mission to the OAS, one of our roles is to include and educate our partner agencies in the inter-American human rights system. And I'm pleased to note that in recent years, the U.S. Mission has been able to bring the appropriate representatives from the parts of the U.S. government most directly involved with the issues that are brought to hearings before this commission. And in that regard, we welcome today colleagues from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Justice. And they will share with you the many ways that the U.S. government shares your concerns and is addressing the status of sexual and reproductive health and rights in the United States. So I'd like to turn to Director Melanie Fontes Rayner from the Office of Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to begin. Thank you. Um, thank you to the commissioners, um, all of the civil society participants, Astrid, Kirsten, Katie, Carla, and Monica. Thank you for all that you're doing and being here today. Um, thank you for this opportunity to provide the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights an update regarding the status of sexual and reproductive health in the United States. I am pleased to appear to appear before you today with my colleagues from the Department of State and the Department of Justice on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration. Um, my name is Melanie Fontes Rayner. I run a civil rights office that is a national office. Unlike most civil rights offices, we don't just do civil rights. We also are in charge of privacy, health information privacy, so we regulate HIPAA. Um, it is such a great honor to serve within the Biden-Harris administration as the director of this office. In this role, my office leads the department's enforcement of federal civil rights and privacy laws, directed policy and related strategic initiatives. Part of this enforcement work is ensuring that entities that receive federal financial assistance do not discriminate on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, and sex characteristics, age, and disability across the programs and services at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Following the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization to overturn Roe v. Wade, access to abortion depends on the state you live in even more than it did before. On June 24, 2022, the Supreme Court cast aside a half century of precedent protecting, protecting reproductive rights and access to abortion and in the process, undermine women's autonomy, health, privacy, and safety. The ability to decide one's own future is a fundamental American value, and few decisions are more significant and personal than the decision as to whether and when to start or expand a family. Fundamental rights to privacy, autonomy, freedom, and equality are now being denied to millions of women across the country with grave implications for their health, their lives, and their well-being. The Dobbs decision has led to a devastating consequences that undermine the reproductive freedom in the United States. Reproductive health care access has become fragmented and extremely dangerous. Abortion bans have taken effect in some states, putting the health and lives of women in jeopardy forcing people, as described earlier, to travel hundreds of miles for care, threatening to criminalize doctors for providing the health care that their patients need and that they are trained to provide. The decision had and will continue to have an immediate and irreversible impact on the lives of people across the country and has already been shown to exasperate the disproportionate lack of access to care experienced by women who are racial and ethnic minorities, indigenous women and women with low incomes. 
These disparities predated the Dobbs decision, but the decision continues to profoundly worsen this impact. In the wake of the Dobbs decision, President Biden swiftly mobilized his administration to protect access to reproductive health care and established an interagency task force on reproductive health care access to oversee these efforts. This was co-chaired by HHS Secretary Javier Becerra and Assistant to the President and Director of the White House Gender Policy Council, Jennifer Klein, and enlisting other senior level administration officials, including myself, to identify opportunities across the federal government to protect access to reproductive health care services. Since the Dobbs decision, the President has issued three executive orders on reproductive health care, one of which is focused specifically on access to contraception and a presidential memorandum further directing efforts to safeguard access to medication abortion. His first executive order directed HHS to submit an action plan to protect and strengthen reproductive care that outlined the department's actions to ensure access to the full range of reproductive health care, including abortion and contraception. HHS's efforts are led by the task force on reproductive health care access, which Secretary Becerra established on the last anniversary when Roe was still alive. Um, and those are comprised of senior level HHS officials who regularly convene and coordinate policymaking across the department. On behalf of the Biden-Harris administration, HHS has worked to protect and strengthen access to reproductive care that is consistent with federal law amidst unprecedented efforts by anti-abortion officials that the, at the federal and state level to restrict access to abortion and contraception. HHS continues to take action to defend reproductive rights and support access to the full spectrum of reproductive care that is consistent with federal law. HHS actions have been centered on six core priorities. One, protecting access to abortion services. Two, safeguarding access to birth control. Three, promoting and protecting patient privacy. Four, promoting access to accurate information. Five, ensuring non-discrimination in healthcare delivery. And six, evidence-based decision-making at the FDA. I will highlight a few actions HHS has taken to ensure women across the country are able to access the care they need consistent with federal law. Protecting abortion services. We know that access to the full range of reproductive health care is essential to an individual's health. While many states ban, restrict, or are seeking to restrict abortion care, HHS released guidance to remind the public and relevant stakeholders of federal laws that protect individuals' access to critical reproductive health care services, including abortion in emergency situations. In July of 2022, HHS issued guidance and sent a letter from Secretary Becerra to remind all Medicare participating hospitals that the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, otherwise known as EMTALA, requires Medicare participating emergency departments to offer life or health-saving abortion services when they constitute the necessary stabilizing care for emergency medical conditions. And in May of 2023, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services announced it was pursuing investigations of hospitals that may not have offered necessary stabilizing care to an individual experiencing an emergency medical condition in violation of EMTALA. HHS Secretary Becerra made clear that this administration and HHS will, quote, use the full extent of our legal authority consistent with the orders from the courts to enforce protections for individuals who seek emergency care, including when that care is abortion. HHS also issued in August of 2022 a letter to U.S. governors inviting them to apply for a Medicaid Section 1115 demonstration project to provide increased access to reproductive health care for women. HHS has also taken steps to protect the privacy of patients seeking reproductive health care, as well as their providers. In June of 2022, the Office for Civil Rights, my office, issued guidance reminding the public about how the existing HIPAA privacy rule protects individuals' medical information, known as protected health information, or PHI, relating to reproductive health care, and making it clear that the current HIPAA privacy rule permits but does not require providers to disclose PHI to third parties. We also heard numerous reports of concern that period trackers and other health information apps on smartphones may threaten patients' rights to privacy by disclosing data, including geolocation data. In response, HHS issued that guidance that reminds the public of the extent to which private medical information 
is protected by the HIPAA privacy and security rules on personal smartphones, tablets, and provided tips for protecting individuals' privacy when using such applications on phones or devices. Lastly, HHS also took additional steps to bolster privacy. The HHS Office for Civil Rights released a proposed rule which would prohibit the use or disclosure of PHI to investigate or prosecute patients, providers, and others involved in the provision of legal reproductive health care, including abortion care. HHS has heard from patients and providers and organizations representing thousands of individuals that this change is needed to protect patient provider confidentiality and to prevent the private, excuse me, and prevent private medical records from being used against people for merely seeking, obtaining, providing, or facilitating lawful reproductive health care, including abortion. The HHS Office of National Coordinator for Health Information Technology also issued clarifying guidance to underscore that information blocking rules work in tandem with the HIPAA privacy rule and other privacy protective laws, making clear that doctors and other medical providers can take steps to protect patients' electronic health information, including their information related to reproductive health care, and that patients have the right to ask that their electronic health information generally not be disclosed by the physician, hospital, or other health care provider, including to other health care providers. In addition to these actions, HHS has taken to protect patient privacy, the department is also committed to ensuring that everyone can access health care, including reproductive health care, free from discrimination. In June of 2022, HHS, through the Office for Civil Rights, issued a proposed rule that would strengthen the regulations to advance non-discrimination in health care under the Affordable Care Act. In addition, HHS recognized the critical and unique role that pharmacists, pharmacies play in American health care system to ensure non-discriminatory access to medications. HHS issued guidance to roughly 60,000 U.S. retail pharmacies clarifying their obligations under federal civil rights laws to ensure that pharmacies and the pharmacists that they employ do not discriminate on the basis of sex or disability. These civil rights requirements include patients' ability to access lawfully prescribed medication from their pharmacy free from discrimination, including for early pregnancy loss from miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, contraception, or other conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or ulcers. HHS reminded pharmacies that such discrimination, even delays in providing these medications, can have significant health consequences. As a result of this work, HHS was able to work with Walgreens and CVS to make reforms for how women receive information about their prescriptions and get better training for pharmacists to treat persons with disabilities. HHS revised this guidance in September of 2023 to clarify that the guidance does not require pharmacies to fill prescriptions for medication for the purpose of abortion, nor does the guidance suggest or imply the obligation of pharmacies to fill prescription for medication in violation of state laws. In addition to this enforcement work, it is more important than ever that women have access to affordable birth control and the freedom to make decisions about their own health and families. Under the Affordable Care Act, most plans are required to offer coverage of birth control with no out-of-pocket cost. As a result, millions of women have access low-cost birth control. In recent years, the department has taken steps to further improve this access. For example, in June of 2022, HHS and the Department of Labor met with employee health benefit plans and health insurers to call on the insurance industry to commit to meeting their obligations to provide access to contraception as required by the law. After this convening, HHS and the Departments of Labor and Treasury took action to clarify protections for birth control under the Affordable Care Act. According to a report released by HHS in 2020, 58 million women benefited from the ACA's preventative services and birth control coverage, which has saved billions of dollars in out-of-pocket spending on contraception since the ACA was passed. In response to increasing complaints from women and covered dependents about not receiving this coverage, the departments then issued guidance to remind those issuers and plans of their requirements and emphasize the department's emphasis on enforcement of the law. In January of 2023, HHS, alongside the Departments of Labor and Treasury, issued a proposed rule to provide a new pathway for individuals to access birth control when their private health insurance is exempt from covering it. And in July of 2023, the FDA approved OPIL, a tablet for non-prescription use to prevent pregnancy, the first daily oral birth control approved for US, 
approved for US, use in the US, excuse me, without a prescription. And in September of 2023, HHS, alongside the Departments of Labor and Treasury, sought public input on how to best ensure coverage for access for the over-the-counter preventative services, including birth control, at no cost and without a prescription by the healthcare provider. As a sign of the administration's continued commitment to improving access to contraception, in June of 2023, President Biden issued an executive order strengthening access to affordable, high-quality contraception and family planning services. This executive order directs HHS to examine ways to expand and promote access to contraception across all of its programs. In closing, in the past year, we have seen how the state you can live in can undermine your ability to access care. Women seeking reproductive health care, including abortion care, find themselves living in care deserts, and some have had to travel thousands of miles to access the medical care that they need. We have heard the tragic cases of women being denied health and life-saving care because of the chaos and the fear that Dobbs has created. We have heard from doctors and healthcare providers worried about whether or not they can provide in care with, that they are trained for because of the harsh penalties and realities they live in. We have heard from medical students and residents who are making decisions about their careers and futures because of this decision. We at HHS continue to activate all divisions within our department in service to our commitment to ensuring women across the country are able to access the care they need consistent with federal law. Secretary Becerra and other senior officials at HHS continue to travel the country, meeting with Americans in their communities, listening to their stories, and making sure they know their rights. My office alone has facilitated over 25 convenings across the country to speak with health providers, students, local and state officials, patients, and others to discuss HHS's work and understand the challenges providers and patients have in providing and accessing abortion. As we continue this work, HHS and the Biden-Harris administration are committed to taking action to defend reproductive rights and ensure women have access to the full range of reproductive health care that is consistent with federal law and includes abortion. Thanks. Thank you. Distinguished commissioners, secretariat staff, and colleagues, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. Members of civil society, thank you as well, including for the very open and candid presentation. My name is Jody Morse, and I serve as a Deputy Associate Attorney General at the Department of Justice, where I work closely with the Department's Reproductive Rights Task Force. Jody, sorry. I think the microphone's not very close to your mouth. Oh. Excuse me. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Oh. Um, I work closely with the Department's Reproductive Rights Task Force that was established in response to the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs and is led by the Associate Attorney General, Vanita Gupta. The department greatly appreciates the chance to hear today from those impacted by the Dobbs decision and to provide information on how we are working to safeguard reproductive freedoms that are protected by federal law. The Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade has had a devastating impact on people and communities across the nation. Restrictions on access to abortion at the state level have surged and are disproportionately affecting people of limited financial means, people of color, and other vulnerable communities. The department's reproductive rights task force consists of senior officials and dedicated staff from the, across the department who are working daily to address the new complex and widespread threats to reproductive health that have emerged in the wake of Dobbs. To date, the task force has met with a broad array of stakeholder groups ranging from state attorneys general to foreign delegations to members of litigating and reproductive justice groups, um, including some of those present here. To, we've discussed the fallout from Dobbs and have this has helped us gather information about on the ground developments to help inform the department's work. Um, our work falls into a number of buckets that I'm gonna discuss briefly. First, we are monitoring state laws and enforcement actions that threaten to infringe on federal protections of reproductive rights. The department will not hesitate to take legal action where appropriate, including by filing affirmative suits, statements of interest, or by intervening in private party litigation. In August of 2022, the department, with the support of HHS, filed suit against the state of Idaho under the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, EMTALA. Um, that act mandates that every hospital that receives Medicare funds provide necessary stabilizing treatment, including abortion care in certain instances, to a patient who arrives at an emergency room suffering from a medical condition that could place their life or health in serious jeopardy. 
The department successfully obtained a preliminary injunction blocking the enforcement of Idaho's abortion ban as applied to medical care required by Amtala. Litigation is ongoing there while the district court's preliminary injunction remains in effect. Attorney General Merrick Garland has also made clear since the day Dobbs was decided that the department will defend bedrock constitutional protections of women who reside in states that have blocked access to reproductive health care. This means that women must remain free to travel to states where that care is lawful and under the First Amendment, individuals must also remain free to inform and counsel each other about reproductive care that is available across state lines. Second, we are vigorously defending federal agencies, including the Food and Drug Administration, as litigation arises. In April 2023, the department successfully obtained a stay from the Supreme Court in Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine v. FDA, which means that mifeprestone, a medication that FDA approved more than two decades ago as safe and effective for the termination of early pregnancy, will remain available as that case continues to make its way through the courts. On September 8th, the department sought Supreme Court review of the recent decision from the Fifth Circuit in that case, a decision that would severely harm women across the country and deprive patients of a safe and effective medication. Among other cases, we are also defending HHS's Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services and litigation brought in Texas um, concerning guidance on emergency care guaranteed by EMTALA. Third, we are advising federal agencies that they consider policies and actions to preserve access to reproductive health services. The department's Office of Legal Counsel has published opinions concluding that the VA had authority to adopt its interim final rule allowing access to certain reproductive health services at VA clinics, that the Department of Defense may lawfully provide funds to enable service members and their defendants to travel out of state for abortion care, and that HHS can provide transportation to women seeking abortions where it has authority to do so without violating the Hyde Amendment. The Office of Legal Counsel also published an opinion advising the U.S. Postal Service that the Federal Comstock Act does not generally prohibit the mailing of mifepristone. And the department has made clear that it will support and provide representation to any federal employees who are subject to legal actions for appropriately carrying out their duties under federal law. Fourth, the department's Civil Rights Division is continuing its work to enforce the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, or the FACE Act. The FACE Act prohibits anyone from obstructing access to reproductive health services, including abortion services, reproductive health services provided by pharmacies, and pregnancy counseling services, through violence, threats of violence, or property damage. The Civil Div Rights Division has brought more than 20 cases against more than 50 defendants for criminal FACE Act violations since January of 2021. The department has also instituted and successfully resolved a civil face action, filed statements of interest in private face litigation, and prepared training for state attorney general's offices, which can similarly bring civil actions under the FACE Act. In addition, the department's civil rights division leads the national tax task force on violence against reproductive health care that brings together investigators and prosecutors from the civil rights division and national security division, the FBI, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, the U.S. Marshal Service, and the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Fifth, pursuant to President Biden's Executive Order 14076 on protecting access to reproductive health care services, the Department and the White House Counsel's Office convened pro bono counsel, bar associations, law professors, and public interest groups to identify gaps in legal representation and to catalyze coordination and action. Coming out of that convening, Pro bono counsel and nonprofit groups have stood up a clearinghouse to provide legal assistance, and the department has met with lawyers on the front lines to understand the needs and gaps in legal assistance for patients, providers, and others. Finally, the department is providing technical assistance to Congress in connection with draft legislation that would, for example, codify reproductive rights, protect the right to travel, and ensure access to comprehensive reproductive health care services. In closing, I want to reiterate that our work as a department is ongoing. We will continue to use all available tools to safeguard reproductive freedoms protected under federal law. And again, we appreciate the opportunity to appear at this hearing um, and to hear your questions, comments, and concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative of the State. This, these were very full and rich presentations, and I hope we can if they're available, if we can get some of your speaking notes. 
Yes? Yes, thank you very much. And so now where we are now is for the Commission to ask any questions or make any comments which it may wish to do that. And I would like to introduce uh, Commissioner Mantia, who will begin. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner Clark. Uh, and actually, I'm going to speak in Spanish. Voy a hablar en español porque si bien esta es una audiencia eh, sobre Estados Unidos, el cier lo cierto es que hay mucho impacto en muchas mujeres latinas que viven también en los Estados Unidos. Eso es lo primero que quería decir. Lo segundo, no puedo dejar de mencionar y recordar a Ruth Baden Ginsburg cuando ella decía qué importante es tener. ¿Es okay? The translation, if I. ¿Está bien? ¿Puedo seguir? Gracias. Ok, thanks. Lo que decía era qué importante es recordar ahora a la jueza Ruth Baden Ginsburg cuando ella decía qué importante es la presencia de las mujeres en la corte y cuando decía que cuando le preguntaban cuándo habría suficientes mujeres, ella decía cuando haya nueve, cuando haya nueve mujeres en la corte y la gente se sorprendía, ella decía, pero si siempre ha habido nueve hombres y nunca nadie se sorprendió. Y yo creo que eso no es casual y creo que es muy importante porque hay otra reflexión que quiero hacer, eh, cómo... Cuando hablamos de democracia o de países democráticos, calificamos ciertos países como democráticos, no obstante la situación difícil y complicada que se está dando en materia de los derechos de las mujeres. Yo saludo la presencia del Estado y saludo toda la información que nos han dado. Eh, y creo que vamos más o menos en la misma línea, pero no puedo dejar de expresar mi preocupación por todo lo que está pasando ahora. Eso en primer lugar. Quería pedirle también tanto al Estado como a la sociedad civil, la información desagregada sobre las mujeres, las niñas, las mujeres afro, las mujeres indígenas, eh, y también las políticas que se están dando si tienen esta visión diferenciada. Pero además de eso, y no quiero abusar del tiempo, ah, otra cosa importante, perdón, quería saber si además de lo que nos han contado, han sufrido amenazas de judicialización, de investigación, llamadas u otros tipos de represalias por las acciones que están ustedes desarrollando. Lo segundo y que me parece lo más importante, cuando hablamos de, 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 del caso en concreto y el tema del aborto, no estamos hablando solo un tema de mujeres, es un tema de derechos humanos y de democracia. Y yo creo que eso es lo que hay que entender. Y voy a dar algunos ejemplos, ¿no? Más allá... Ya tuvimos otras audiencias con Estados Unidos, más allá de la declaración a la Convención Americana. Hay un principio básico, que es el principio de no discriminación. Y entonces, un Estado, así no haya ratificado ningún tratado, está obligado por el principio de no discriminación, que es una norma perentoria. Entonces, cuando vemos circunstancias que afectan de manera específica a un grupo, estamos hablando de una situación de discriminación. Pero no solamente eso. Lo que Crystal nos ha narrado, y le agradezco mucho la presencia, es un acto de trato cruel, inhumano, degradante, ¿no? Y la prohibición de la tortura es una norma imperativa, más allá de los tratados. Y lo tercero, y de ahí también mi preocupación, yo fui relatora de personas migrantes, de personas en movilidad humana, que incluyen no solamente los migrantes, incluyen también la de los desplazados internos. Y aquí se están dando desplazamientos al interior de los Estados Unidos para acceder al aborto. Es decir, ya no es solamente las mujeres, sino el desplazamiento que se está dando. Eh, más allá de los estándares, siempre se ha reconocido la facultad del Estado de regular el tema del aborto. Pero esa regulación no puede atentar contra los derechos, en este caso, de las mujeres. El relator de la tortura, contra la tortura, hace años identificó que aquellas mujeres que reciben tratos crueles, inhumanos, cuando tratan de acceder al aborto, se configura tortura. Y la ex relatora sobre ejecuciones arbitrarias dijo que aquellas mujeres que mueren porque tienen miedo de acceder al servicio de salud, se puede configurar responsabilidad del Estado por ejecución arbitraria porque es una violación al derecho a la vida, no solamente al derecho a la salud. Y así por el estilo. Creo que quiero agradecer por eso la presencia de ambas partes y quisiera que esta reflexión nos llevara a pensar en concreto. No es un tema de mujeres solamente, es un tema de derechos humanos. 
no es un tema solo de derecho de salud, es un tema de derecho a la vida, es un tema de derecho a, auto de a la autonomía. Y no podemos hablar de democracias si seguimos teniendo a un grupo de la población que no puede decidir libremente sobre el acceso a su propia vida y a su autonomía. Así que saludo y agradezco la lucha de ustedes. No, y como siempre digo, no solo por estar aquí hoy, sino por lo que hacen a diario y por la cantidad de mujeres que representan. Antes de venir aquí, estuve en un evento en la OEA, ya estaban algunas de las colegas, y se decía algo que es muy importante. Cuando hay crisis, cuando hay retrocesos en la democracia, lo primero que se pone en riesgo son los derechos de las mujeres, lo que ya se creía conquistado. Y la Comisión Interamericana ha dado esta audiencia, entre otras cosas, para decir ante el mundo nuestra preocupación y nuestro respaldo a la libertad y autonomía de las mujeres. Gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much, Commissioner Mantilla. Uh, Jorge, would you have any comments or questions? Muchas gracias por las presentaciones. Gracias a la participación del Estado. De manera muy breve, solo en seguimiento al comunicado de prensa que emitió la Comisión en junio de 2023, preguntarles si pueden aportar por escrito información sobre la situación de los profesionales de salud. Eh, la Comisión señaló una preocupación por una situación de incertidumbre respecto de la información y servicios que podrían pues aportar debido al temor por, por sanciones eh, judiciales o administrativas. Entonces, la información que eh, pudieran eventualmente hacer llegar a la comisión por escrito. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you very much, Jorge. I just have a few questions. First of all, I want to join uh, my colleagues in thanking the representatives of civil society and the state for um, this presentation and we are in a in a situation which we don't I don't want to say we don't often get in the commission but maybe not as frequently as we would like a high degree of consensus uh, around the issue that is um, that's on our mind and so we definitely have that today I wanted to say that my mother was a woman who was Roman Catholic and sorry for the personal testimony she was very de de devout Catholic and um, she had six children in six years and then she promptly went to work for Family Plan Association where she spent the rest of her life because she really believed, as, uh, as you have uh, articulated here today, that women have the absolute non-negotiable right to control their fertility and to make decisions about their body. And that's what we're talking about. Um, it, but it's, a, it's also, a, uh, so it's a women's rights issue, but it's also a big social justice issue in the ways in which you all have described. Because those who, are, uh, who live in situations of intersectional marginalization and discrimination are also the ones who have the least access to reproductive health services. And so it, it, you know, it, it also exacerbates the inequalities gap that we keep talking about that uh, exists in our region, the Americas and the Caribbean. The other thing I want to say is we're talking about the United States here, but this issue is also a profound issue for much of this, um, these Americas and the Caribbean. The United States is not particular or peculiar here. Many of us come from countries where I, either abortion is completely criminalized or access to uh, uh, termination services completely criminalized or only allowable under very restricted circumstances, but also even where you can access them, it's, your, it's a stigmatized service. And uh, service providers are also fearful about reprisals and also the stigmatization. So it's, it's a, there's a lot of complication here, although the simplicity of the control of women's fertility is so clear for us. And I think um, Commissioner Mantia said, this is about women's rights, but in a sense it's about, not in a sense, it is about um, the question of power and control. And so we, we know that this is an issue that we, we take very seriously and are quite attentive to in this commission. I have some questions to ask. So I, it's something you said, I think it was Jody, that intrigued me, um, and I should know a little bit more about it. But you said that the government, the, 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 the current government, closely monitors state laws that infringe on federal, I, I, did you say rights, federal rights, or federal rules? I wasn't. Perez, yes. And so I wanted to have just a better sense of what would trigger 
um, that federal law? Is it a receipt of a federal funding? What might be the triggers that would, the, the circumstances that would trigger that federal involvement and the federal protection within the context of, uh, of a state denial of reproductive services? And um, for uh, the representatives of civil society and Justin, thank you very much for your personal testimony, which had to have been very difficult to give. Um, I, I kind of wanted to ask you, was there a suspicion? Did the health service providers have a suspicion about why you were in hospital um, that was animating this peculiar restrictive um, conduct on their part? Um, I'm just not sure. I just wanted to ask what was your perspective of what was happening at, at the time? And, and now, also the question, we've been talking about access to reproductive health services, but what about reproductive health products? Um, I, uh, wh are we seeing co the access to contraception being limited? And I'm not only talking about the, the, af what the, the after pill or? Yes, I mean generally, uh, are, you seeing, are we seeing uh, some real movements towards the restriction of um, access to contraception? And then do we have any examples of prosecution of health providers since the Dobbs, okay. since the Dobbs, and can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing there and how courts are responding, if there are having prosecutions, how are courts responding to those prosecutions? Thank you very much. So now you have, I think, on your 12 minutes? Yes. Yes, 12 minutes civil society and then 12 minutes for the state. Thank you so much for your questions, commissioners. Uh, we'll try to briefly address them. Uh, and in the interest of time, we will also make a supplemental submission with additional information uh, to some of the particular points that you raised. I'm going to first turn to my colleague, Astrid Ackerman. Thank you so much, commissioners, for your questions. Um, so I want to first provide more information about the legal landscape on abortion in the U.S. post-Dobbs uh, by sharing more about the types of bans we're seeing introduced and enacted across the country. Um, this year, states introduced approximately 500 bills intended to restrict access to abortion. Legislature focused on pre-viability abortion bans and restricting medication abortion. In total, there are 22 states with abortion restrictions. These restrictions have exceptions, most of them. They have exceptions for the life of the mother and some of them for um, health-threatening conditions. Some of them also have exceptions for sexual violence situations. The issue with these exceptions is that, as I stressed earlier, these are not preventing human rights violations. They are often written in conflicting and uh, non-medical terminology that results in confusion for providers about what type of care is uh, criminal or not. They are afraid providers of um, facing imprisonment in Texas, for example, it can be up to 99 years in prison, so life prison, civil fines, professional discipline, including losing their medical license. So then the lack of clarity in these exceptions and the very, very, very serious um, fines and punishment that comes from providing abortion results in the chilling of medical care. It, uh, ends up being that they are having to deny or delay medically necessary abortion care until a patient's health deteriorates to a point that the provider or sometimes the hospital staff or the hospital management uh, feels confident that what they're doing, providing the abortion, is not a crime and that they're not going to end up in prison for providing that care. So these experiences of pregnant people, for example, in Texas, like Kirsten's, um, demonstrate that these abortion bans cause pregnant people great harm, including, as you've mentioned, um, threatening their right to live free from torture, from cruel and humane and degrading treatment, and from their right to life. Thank you so much. 
And then I will also discuss uh, and give uh, more context to what is happening to attacks on medication abortion in the U.S. So medication abortion is the most commonly used method of abortion here in the U.S. It accounts for more than half of all the abortions in the U.S. And here in the U.S. context, it usually refers to the combined use of mifepristone and misoprostol. So the regime here in the U.S. is those two medications. This um, medication has been approved by the FDA. It has a well-documented safety record and anti-abortion legislatures, in part emboldened by the Dobbs decision, have sought to restrict access to medication abortion in order to fulfill their campaign of creating a total ban for abortion in the country. Um, during this legislative session that just ended, six states introduced total medication abortion bans. And we're also seeing efforts to restrict medication abortion in the courts from anti-abortion groups. In November of 2022, as the state mentioned, um, anti-abortion groups sued the FDA in the case Alliance versus the FDA over its approval of Mifepristone more than 20 years ago. The case is ongoing. It's still, it, as, as it stands right now, it's awaiting Supreme Court review. And if the lawsuit is ultimately successful, access to Mifepristone will cease in every single state in the U.S., even in states where it is protected. This case poses a major threat to people's ability to access abortion across the country. Blocking access to Mifepristone would force all patients to have procedural abortions, which would in turn inundate clinics, many of which, as Katie noted with concern, are already overwhelmed by influx of patients from states that have banned abortion. In addition, leading medical organizations, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the American Medical Association, predict that cutting off access to abortion, including medication abortion, will exacerbate what is already an impending maternal health crisis in this country. This lawsuit is part of broader efforts to ban abortion, including medication abortion na nationwide, in order to prevent people from exercising any modicum of control over their own lives and their own futures. Thank you. Um, yes, I would like to go next. And um, it's, this has just been a really fruitful conversation um, so far. But there's two things I want to make note of from your questions, right? One question that was brought to the floor, floor was, you know, the um, how can we talk about the impact on black folks, on people of color, and what this decision has really meant for our communities. And I'd like to attack that question um, from a very personal perspective, right? I am a black queer woman that has lived and worked in the South my entire life of, in the United States of America. And so not only am I organizing against this, I am living this reality every single day. Um, and so I live in a region in this country that has yet to expand Medicaid. That has had, that's had a huge impact on thousands of people being just left behind with no access to health care at all. On top of that, the fear that has come up because of this decision is incredible, right? Folks are scared because they don't have access to care. Black women in particular and people of color, women of color and pregnant people of color are dying in childcare, right? We've talked about that repeatedly today. We're also, we gotta also talk about the economic part of this too because black women only make 64 cents on a dollar in this country. So when you add that to the equation, it makes it even more of an impact. And then on top of that, we have to talk about the way that this fight for abortion access is a fight against these systems of white supremacy, patriarchy, and all of that because when we think about the fact that black women are having to watch black children be gunned down in the streets, and folks not having access to the health care or the food or the clean water that they need, all of these things are connected in this decision. It's not a single issue. And so that's why, you know, it's important for us to really address it in that way. And the other thing I want to make mention of, too, that, that I feel like is really important to name in this moment, because the impact is great, is the way that criminalization shows up in this issue, too. So just to give you all some, some important kind of stats on that, um, 
We also know, first of all, before I say that, the Inter-American Commission, we know that you all have already stated um, in relation to other countries in the Americas, total abortion bans have a disproportionate impact on women's rights. And this commission has specifically noted the harmful effect of the criminalization of total abortion bans. But currently, 33 states have criminal abortion laws. Of these, at least 16 states have made it a felony to perform an abortion at any state of gestation. Between 2000 and 2020, at least 61 people were criminally investigated or arrested for ending their own pregnancies or helping someone else to do so. These prosecutions disproportionately target poor and minority communities. As a whole, healthcare professionals are leaving states with bans, intensifying the lack of health care in those areas. Others are delaying when they start providing prenatal care to avoid being investigated if their patient miscarries. And some are limiting the information they give their patients or to write in their medical charts, right? And laws that criminalize abortion further normalize the idea that pregnant people's most fundamental rights can be modified or suspended, and they extend the reach of a criminal justice system that is already notorious for discrimination against people of color. That's the impact that we're talking about here. It's all interconnected. And, and criminalization of abortion and abortion bans have broadly, they broadly impact more than just abortion. They make all pregnant people more vulnerable to criminalization based on conduct during pregnancy and across all pregnancy outcomes. So that's just a little taste, unfortunately, right, of the impact that this decision is having. And not to mention how this is also impacting the way that voting shows up in this conversation, right? Because when we even think about those most marginalized communities and sectors of this country, right? Those state houses are not led by people who look like us, right? And so the way that that shows up and how that has disproportionately impacted the way that this, that, that, that this conversation is happening is also important to name in this moment. I wanted to speak a little bit about the differences um, between access and between an access state and a banned state of what abortion access looks for, mm -hmm. like for the people who are living in those states. And a perfect example is captured in the reality of our West Virginia and Maryland clinics. Um, you know, the difference between access states and banned states, um, West Virginia has a total abortion ban, um, except in the case of a non-medically viable fetus, an ectopic pregnancy, or a medical emergency and only survivors and victims of rape and incest can obtain abortions up to eight weeks gestation, unless they're minors, in which case they can obtain abortion up to 14 weeks gestation. Um, but in both instances, that, uh, they must either report the abuse to law enforcement or have received medical treatment for the abuse. Um, so there are tremendous barriers. They are effectively exceptions in name only. Um, if a West Virginia needs an abortion, they will have to travel at least three and a half hours to our Maryland clinic or even farther to another state um, or to another clinic um, or manage their abortion at home, which opens them to surveillance, investigation, and criminalization, as Monica discussed. Um, the legal landscape in Maryland is very different from West Virginia. In Maryland, um, at our clinic there, we can provide abortion care up to 24 weeks in the state, um, and advanced practice registered nurses um, are also able to cover abortion care with appropriate training. Um, Abortion is covered by both private insurance and Medicaid, um, which is a state and federally funded insurance program for low income individuals and families. Even prior to the fall of Roe um, in the state of West Virginia, Medicaid was not able to cover abortion care. A person's ability to get the health care that they need to plan their families and futures varies drastically based on where they live in the U.S. Um, this is true of the two states in which I work and across the country where large regions have become abortion deserts. Mm -hmm. A recent study recently uh, estimated that 14% of the population is more than 200 miles from the nearest abortion facility, while the average American is 86 miles away from a provider. Our right to make decisions about our bodies and access to health care um, to exercise our decisions should not depend on what state we live in, yet that's the reality that we're currently facing in the U.S. And I also wanted to highlight the, the difficulty of accessing abortion care for adolescents in West Virginia. Absolutely. Speaking from personal experience, I had an abortion whenever I was 17. Um, I did not want to involve my parents in my decision, but I had no idea what the laws were regarding abortion access, and that was several years prior to Dobbs. Adolescents just by default face greater financial and logistical barriers when they're trying to access abortion care, and this was the case before Dobbs, as I can attest to from my personal experience, and now total abortion bans are making this problem even more acute. Um, and so I think that, you know, 
we really need to be considering what this is doing to the youth in the United mm -hmm. States because when there's no access to a clinic, coordinating travel, lodging, and obtaining the money to pay for an abortion can become an insurmountable obstacle for a teenager. Mm -hmm. I, I know we are well over our time, but are, <laughs> well, I definitely don't want to take time away uh, from the commission, but uh, just to wrap by saying uh, we look forward to submitting uh, additional materials in response to your questions, and we would just ask the commission to continue your work and strengthen the monitoring of this worsening situation, conduct a working visit to the United States to meet with healthcare providers, civil society organizations, and community members to hear uh, more from them on directly how they have been impacted. We also invite you to hear more testimony from people who have been directly impacted. We just heard uh, one or two stories here today, but there are so, so many more. Uh, and please keep calling on the United States to align its laws and policies with international and regional human rights standards. Thank you so much again for having us and, and thank you all of you all for sharing your stories. Representative of the state. Thanks, just very briefly let me say for any questions that are specific to the Department of Justice lane, we will take those, yes. uh, consider them for a written response, but Melanie from HHS will respond to much of what's been said for the US government. Uh, thank you for the opportunity again um, to Representative Mantia, Man Mantia Bacon. Yes. Uh, yo hablo español, pero un poquito despacio. That's fine, that's fine. Okay. Uh, pero yo hablo. Um, Good. <laughs> um, but so just a, a couple of things in response to some of your concerns, and I think consistent with what our colleagues in the civil society have flagged. Um, you know, President Biden has signed three executive orders in this space. One of those executive orders called on the Department of Health and Human Services to do convenings across the country to make sure that people understand their rights. Um, and I think the, the underlying tension here, right, is that we have a system now where states are allowed to pass bans on various types of, I mean, and it's not just abortion, right, there's yeah. bans on healthcare across the U.S. now in various spaces, in, in, including the LGBTQI space. Um, and so we know that in those situations, it's really important for people to understand what, what federal law is, that federal civil rights laws continue, and that there are privacy laws that help people. Um, I run a very small office. Um, we're really small. We're not even a rounding budget decimal, right, when it comes to these big dollars of other agencies. And so we do a lot of engagement with stakeholders across the country, with legal advocates, with patient groups, provider groups. I've talked to, I have personally been in 13 states that have banned abortion um, physically. Um, and in those conversations, whether it's Indiana or Texas or other states across the country, um, you know, we hear similar stories, right? We hear stories of women being told to go wait in their car so they can bleed out more. We hear stories um, where doctors say, you know, even for my patients that want to continue their pregnancy, that I advise them, this doctor said, you know, I advise them to leave the state at a certain point because it's just not safe for me to continue to provide them medical care and I'm restricted in what I can tell them. Um, so, it, you know, I think that experience has, it's been important to me. I know it's important to Secretary Becerra. I know it's important to other federal officials because right at this moment in time, the ability to have um, a federal government that continues to recognize the right to reproductive health care, reproductive justice, and abortion is really important. And, and in many of these states, even in instances where we're not instantly able to do something, people feel seen and heard by the Biden administration. Um, in that same respect, you know, you talked a little bit about um, fear and being punished, um, a, co a cornerstone of being able to access health care is to have trust in your medical provider. Um, th that is just a fact, right? You have to mm -hmm. trust your nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. your doctor, the providers that give you that care. If you don't have that trust, how are you going to ask questions? How are yeah. you going to get information about the care that you need? How are you going to be able to have that relationship that we all know should be a part of your medical care? Um, and in my office, we garner that trust, particularly when it comes to privacy. Because again, if providers are put in positions where they have to report people, their data is not protected, that then how are you going to have a conversation with that provider about the right care for you, or the right treatment for you, or how you get a referral to get that care? And so a big part of our rulemaking has been trying to preserve and protect that trust through privacy and making sure that providers around the country understand what the current state of the law is, but they also understand in this rulemaking effort what we're trying to achieve in further advancing and protecting that privacy. Um, 
to Commissioner, uh, actually you're the president, they, uh, Clark, um, president, um, you said you had six kids in six years. Um, I, your mother, sorry, <laughs> you look good. Um, <laughs> four, four is a lot. Um, but so I, um, I am one of two, but my mom is one of 11. Her mom was one of 17. And her dad is one of 13. Um, contraceptives would have been life changing for my family, but also maybe a smaller family. Um, so, you know, I think you flagged a couple of things, and I want to make sure I give my colleague Jody just a brief opportunity um, just to quickly respond. So just when we talk about closely monitoring states, Jody, do you want to start, and then I can uh, pause it a little bit? Sure. I mean, just to respond to your question, President Clark. Oh, sorry. Foiled again by the microphone. Mm -hmm. um, to respond to your question, you know, what we're doing is we're scrutinizing what's going on in the states for areas where you know, there may be a conflict with a particular protection under federal law. And I think our lawsuit in Idaho is probably the best example to crystallize that, um, where we brought a suit alleging that Idaho's total ban on abortion um, conflicted with UMTALA, um, which Melanie and I have both talked about. And that is, there are other protections under federal law, but I think UMTALA, the Emergency Medical and Treatment Act, is the one that's probably uh, easiest to grasp when we're talking about um, federal protections, and that's a clear action that we took, and we have a preliminary injunction in place. In that case, it's working its way through the courts, but that is the current status of it. And I think the, the question also, I think you said, like, what triggers this federal funding? And I, you know, so um, I run a civil rights office. I also have jurisdiction under privacy, as we've talked about a bit. Um, with respect to um, the, Depart the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, we have various statutes, and those statutes you have a hook with respect to federal funding activity. That federal funding can be a really big program like Medicare and Medicaid, right? Most hospitals in the U.S. Um, are Medicare funded. They, they accept Medicare patients. So in the EMTALA litigation, for example, that, that is a really big place where we can have a really big impact because most hospitals accept that. Um, we also have funding sources in some of our authorities, whether it's disability or um, sex-based discrimination, it varies, but we have funding ability to go into different grants, so both in the healthcare services section, so whether it's a grant administered by the National Institutes for Health or um, the Health Services Resources Administration, which run the federally qualified health centers, which is a very big network of clinics here in the United States, we have the ability to do discriminatory work and privacy work in those spaces. Um, we also have um, respect to non-discrimination, a more limited footprint, but we do have a footprint with respect to human services. So some child welfare programs, um, some of the Administration for Children and Family programs, like the Office of Refugee Resettlement, those kinds of programs, we, we certainly have jurisdiction and work across the department in those spaces. Um, with HIPAA, it's, it's different, but it's broader. HIPAA applies across providers, um, data clearing houses, and insurance companies, mostly. And so across that, it's there's no variation. It's small medium and large and so we spend a lot of time working with medium and small size providers because a large health system they might have a outside counsel a privacy officer a whole office that does these things for them versus a small you know rural provider or dentist or other they, they might not and so we try to spend a lot of time educating providers most um, providers don't mean to break the law sometimes they do because they don't know or they don't have the resources to know and so we spend a lot of time in this space in particular with reproductive health care reminding providers that HIPAA itself does not require disclosures of data except to the secretary when there's a large breach um, and to the individual when that individual requests their own data um, and then third, you asked a little bit about the reproductive health access more broadly and, and contraceptives. Um, yes, I think we, um, we at the Department of Health and Human Services have really leaned into this space to make sure that across all of the department, we're not only working with, with our partners in DOJ and enforcing the law, whether it's the Office for Civil Rights or working on litigation, but that we're also looking at our existing programs to see how can we, to um, whether it's a capacity issue, we know a lot of clinics um, now are bursting at the seams. I've heard wait times in places like Colorado, um, 18 months to get certain services because they have so many patients coming in from out of state that those patients then in Colorado cannot get the care and they're now going to Montana and other places. I've heard things in states where, and, and so HHS has worked with, within the Title X program, for example, to provide funding sources to those clinics. Um, working to evaluate birth control, we know again, 
even within the ACA, where 58 million women have benefited from this provision, which is a lot, we still know it's not perfect and there are opportunities for us to improve how insurance companies provide that coverage and making sure that we're thinking of what's next. So we think about over-the-counter contraceptives. How are we going to make that available cost-free, which is why the government put forward a request for information to solicit feedback from the public on this issue. Um, and then last, I think, you know, I would just say, uh, just to put a finer point on the privacy point, um, that the sort of cases we're seeing, and I, I think it's helpful to just talk about it for a minute, we see the things that I have been told or we have had complaints filed or we see, right? So it's somebody going to a state like a California where healthcare is lawful. Um, they're traveling to that state because it has access and they're able to go and get the healthcare that they need. Then another state, another local official coming in and trying to reach in and go after that clinic, that provider, that patient, both within the state of California and also at home when that person goes home. Um, and so this is the problem, my office, right, where we are at this very unique role of what does civil rights mean, but also how do we protect privacy and how is people's information being used? And I think we're at a point in time where um, people's health information is being misused and it's being misused to track people, providers and clinics um, because we don't all agree on the kinds of health care people should receive. And you know, HIPAA itself protects privacy. And so that's why we're evaluating our regulations to try to make sure that that patient provider trust is there and that we can make sure that within the confines of HIPAA at a federal level, we're protecting that protected health information. Um, I have about a minute, so I can just do a quick closing if that's okay. Um, so again, we, you know, the Dobbs decision has led to devastating consequences that undermine the reproductive freedom in the United States. Um, reproductive health care has become fragmented and extreme and dangerous um, as abortion bans have taken effect across the country, putting the health and lives of women in jeopardy, forcing people to travel um, hundreds of miles of, for care, threatening to criminalize doctors for providing health care, and, and limiting them to providing that care that they're trained to do. When the Dobbs decision came down, I was with Secretary Becerra. We were at the last abortion clinic in St. Louis, Missouri. We were there with Congresswoman Cori Bush. It was in her district. Um, at that time, we were all anticipating the Dobbs decision because of the leaked decision. And so the clinic had already started take, making arrangements to mitigate their risk. When the decision came down, we had just finished a round table. There was press in the room and instantly, um, I was in a room with um, primarily black women, black doctors, black patients. And the room was like somebody took a straw and sucked out all the air of it. People were crying, people were upset, and it was instantaneously. And you know, we continued our our day of activities that day required us to then take a bridge, um, maybe a couple miles across to another state, Illinois, where then we were no longer in a care where it was banned because the state attorney general had taken action. We were now in a state where the care was legal. And that's in the United States of America. We have a patchwork of laws that create our healthcare system and create a system of inequities. And so I'm really proud on behalf of the Biden-Harris administration to continue the work that we're doing within the full force of the law to protect and strengthen, ac strengthen access to reproductive health care um, amidst this unprecedented effort by anti-abortion officials at the federal and state level to restrict abortion and contraception. Um, President Biden says that he protects access to health care all health care, and that includes abortion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, it says now, I think we're at the end of the, of the hearing, and, and I want to thank both the representatives of society and the state for your participation and the wealth of information which you've provided and the perspective. There is, as you've, you started by saying, Rashana, that there is an international human rights consensus on uh, the rights of women to have control over and decide freely the number and spacing of their children, and also to have the right to make decisions concerning reproduction free from discrimination, free from violence, free from coercion. Um, so the uh, commission has reiterated that uh, those international standards in, in, in a number of ways over the years, and in relation to the United States in the wake of Dobbs, we have issued press releases where we are reiterating uh, that the, the lack of access to reproductive health services in the fullness of reproductive health services exposes women to dangerous and even deadly practices that put their health and lives at risk, especially those women who are 
uh, are living in poverty or have greater vulnerability because of living lives of discrimination and exclusion, um, and who have and, and th for those women and those people, there's a disproportionate impact. As I said, it's also a so big social justice issue. Um, so the Inter-American Commission will continue to monitor closely the, is the issue here in the United States. I thank you for your recommendation of a working visit. Um, unfortunately, I may not be able to make it with my colleague, Julissa Mantia, as a commissioner, because I think if we do that, it would have to be next year. But yes. I think it's, I'm sure she's sad about that. Um, <laughs> but, <don't> <laughs> yes. But we very much welcome the recommendation, and I, and I think, Jorge, is something that we will try to make a reality um, in 2024. And we also note the other recommendations that you've made for the, for the commission's role in being a voice for uh, a continued strong voice for reproductive rights and paying close attention to what is happening. Um, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm going to just hit the bell. <laughs> <laughs> President Mantia could, um, Macaulay could not be here today, which is why I'm in her, I'm in her, in her sitting in her seat. And as she closes all hearings like this, so shall I. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs>